First 30 seconds. All right, we are hemorrhaging viewers. I gotta get my point across. Buy Ultra Kill. You don't have to watch this video. Spend the time you would have spent watching it buying and playing Ultra Kill. For those who need more convincing, prepare to hear me ramble about something really, really special. When you play an old shooter like this, or the games that inspired it, like Doom, Duke Nukem, or Quake, what's the last thing on your mind? The story. Ultra Kill, like it does with many things, takes this to the extreme. The plot is nine simple words you see after a quick calibration screen where you decide if you want the game to be coherent or not. Mankind is dead, blood is fuel, hell is full. Given what we'll talk about later though, you may have a few questions like, who's that? What is he talking about? How do I kill better? All of the stuff you need to know is kept safely in terminal entries for you to read at your leisure. You want the story? Well, it's all here, just don't expect us to slow down so you can read it. After that, you finally get into the game proper. We're a cutie patootie named V1 and we have to find a weapon. We're dropped into the middle of what looks like a factory with a sign saying, keep out. Okay. I disrespect my surroundings using the punch. It's a simple little melee hit, the type of thing you'd ignore after a while because it's not a gun, but Ultra Kill keeps it relevant in such an amazing way. Before that is a quick movement tutorial. We got a slide that can go on forever, a dash for the ground and air, and a jump to get into said air. The next room is the most important one as we get to combat. We only have the punch, but it's here that the game starts to set itself apart. See, boomer shooters can't get enough of health packs. They love the things. Litter them all around a level, make them scarce to make finding them feel rewarding and relieving, as zoomer shooters go for the old waist-high cover strategy with health slowly recovering as you realize, oh wait, I'm not actually hurt, and your body just spits the bullets out. Like the intro said, blood is fuel as V1 drinks it out of his victims. When you bathe in the blood of your enemies, you get health back. The closest comparison is to Doom's glory kills, which give you back health and ammo when you're done, but those are like their own little sequence away from the normal running and gunning, a second or so long break to relax in the fact that you got some health. Ultra Kill never gives you that break, instead just making it part of the gameplay loop. The closer you stand to an enemy when they spurt, the more health you get back, so aggressive play is rewarded, since the more you get in the faces of your enemies, the more fighting you can do. For a genre all about keeping up the pace and going for gore, it's insanely smart to have killing the enemies let you kill more enemies. After learning more about your moveset, like your wall jump, your super slam, and that this game has points, POINTS FOR GOD'S SAKES, you descend down further into a shaft into hell before sliding through a hallway to the first weapon in the game. The pistol is a super versatile weapon. You get a single shot to start, as well as having a piercing charged shot. The demons we get paired up against at the start of the game are nothing special. They're mostly just bullet fodder, but the game makes sure to let you know that every demon has value, since without them, how else am I supposed to increase my style meter? Yes, lifted straight out of games like Devil May Cry, God of War, and Nightmare Before Christmas, Ultra Kill has a style meter. You get a higher score the more stylishly you dispose of your enemies. Kill a lot at once, kill them with precision, or kill them in unique ways like swapping out weapons quickly or just using your basic movement techs like the Super Slam. Taking the style meter out of character action games and putting it into a shooter is a great idea, incentivizing players to play how the game wants you to, fast and violent. It's also here that we all just gotta come to terms about something. I'm bad at shooters. Yes, yes, I know you're all pretty horrified right now. You're telling me the guy who plays TF2 like this isn't good at shooters? Say it isn't so! Yeah, alright, all that talk about gaming improving your hand-eye coordination was bogus since my gangly fingers can barely write, let alone rocket jump. As such, I played Ultra Kill on lenient difficulty. Am I a goo goo ga, -ga baby for making this choice? I'd say not, but more for pride reasons. I beat Chicken Little on hard. I'm fine in that department. The more so because Ultra Kill is far from an easy game no matter how you play it. When you get a handle on just how much is going on in this game, having enemies hit you a little less than often isn't really going to be a difference maker. Back to the game though, and after getting out of that room, the game gets you comfy with using the environment to deal with enemies. Glass floors can be shot away to send demons to their second death, as beautifully shown in this room made out of nothing but glass. The next room introduces these lanky sons of guns and their projectiles. After killing the first two, we start mingling with demons. Well, I like long walks through blood, hot blood showers, I really just want to talk about blood. This teaches you to prioritize your targets. The little guys running around aren't really anything to worry about, but getting hit in the back of the head with a projectile can suck. The next room, though, is the most important room in the whole game. With one text box, this game goes from a good retro shooter to the best shooter I have ever played. Oh boy! So 
almost every enemy in the game has an attack that can be knocked back with a punch. V1 has the god hand and is here to smite these demons with their own attacks. Parrying is another thing brought over from action games and it makes this game so much deeper. When you first learn it, it's all you're ever going to want to do. However, the hitbox to do it right is tight. You have to time it perfectly and sometimes it may not be a better option than just shooting them with the gun, but on the other hand is the enemy's orb and how it would feel really good if I sent it flying back at him with a new explosive property. In these early levels, I say clear out any immediate threats and then just take the time to practice. It's not an easy process to learn, you're gonna be on death's door a lot in your pursuit of cool, but don't you want to learn a sick kickflip even if the price is being in a full body cast? The rest of the level is more of the same, which you're going to need to learn just to figure out how your fingers work again, even including a secret area where you can score some more points before your first boss fight, Malicious Face. He has two attacks, three orb shots and a big yellow laser. You can parry both of them, but in all likelihood, you're gonna be rusty, maybe even die. Luckily, the game is very generous with respawns as it just docks your grade at the end. Yes, you're given a grade at the end. As you can see here, I'm all but perfect. So flawed, but I did manage to get past. That's a good grade, right? I also missed most of the secrets, but I did complete the level's challenge. Getting all these sweet, sweet points is in service of getting you upgrades. The first one you can get is the coin. The coin is an alternate pistol mode, which lets you flick a coin and then shoot it in midair for a guaranteed headshot. This is by far the most prolific thing to come out of this game and is the most popular weapon. People cannot get enough of this thing and the super high skill ceiling that comes with it. People can perform feats of gaming godhood with one measly shekel, and the videos on it are nothing short of glorious. But me? Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm just not talented enough to do this. I can't pull off coin shots with anything resembling consistency. I honestly prefer the regular pistol's charge shot most of the time because I can pull that off, and in a game like this, I'd rather put the safety of the regular pistol above the flash of the coin. Also, it just doesn't really gel with how I like to play first-person shooters. It's nothing against the coin, obviously. It's a problem with me. Now, could I simply train and be better at aiming to be able to use the coin more consistently? Of course I could. Am I going to do that? Uh, later, I'm busy. After sneaking into a hidden area, you get the chance to sneak a peek at this robot sponsored by Cat and how they are making me look bad. Eagle-eyed viewers may also remember him crossing the door at the room's entrance. Are they my friend? Or are they here to kill me? Add questions for later. All that matters now is moving forward. This level introduces a new trap, these hydraulic presses that turn demons into lemonade. You can get plenty of bonus points by luring demons into them, just make sure you're using your brain when you're around them. After that is a really fun room where you're parallel with the sword machine and have to clear yours out quicker. Oh yeah, keep preening, hotshot! You may have a cool sword arm and a shotgun, but look what I can do! Suck it, nerd! One more crusher room and the level ends with me failing the challenge to find the secret encounter. Which one? On to the next level and we get a more vertically oriented affair. This tall shaft gives us a chance to not only see how high we can jump with the super slam as chaining slam sends you higher and higher, but also hit your head on the roof with a well-timed slide. The next room is the one I recommend perfecting your parry on. As you can see, after playing for less than 20 minutes, I was still trying to get the hang of it. I'm going to need to learn really quick though as we encounter a new type of enemy. It's really lousy at aiming, seeming to think that I'm really tall and thin like a telephone pole before realizing that I'm actually very short and thin like a telephone pole except knocked over. These guys are really easy to deal with, you just gotta aim for the head. Oh, where's the head? Can you find the head? Very good! Next we finally square off with the swords machine named... Well, I guess Betty wouldn't have worked as well. Swords is a tough cookie, especially with just your pistol, but the tide turns when you parry one of their moves. They turn red and get enraged, moving much faster and hitting much harder. The bonus is though they're left standing there for a few seconds where you can just unload shots on them. You can also still parry them while enraged and it will stun them again. Luckily, Swords Machine flees after you deal half their life bar and they drop a new weapon, the shotgun. And this is where the real game begins. The shotgun is a shotgun, simple spread shot with a grenade launcher alt fire. Where the magic begins is in a simple lesson about how bullets work in Ultra Kill. See, you can parry most attacks in the game, ones that don't fall under the purview of hit scan. This includes attacks like the malicious face's laser and your own pistol. 
isn't, hit scan is your shotgun's blast. So if the timing is right, you can parry your own shotgun and blast to make it explosive and more deadly. Or as it's affectionately referred to, you punch the bullets out of your gun faster than you can shoot them. I feel really bad for discovering this when I did because when I found it out, I realized no other shotgun would ever satisfy me the same way again. On top of that, it entirely ruined my playstyle as now this is the only thing I ever wanted to do. Pistol? Nope. Other weapons you get later? Not a chance. I just want to punch shotguns. This is the most fun thing in the entire game to me. Nothing comes close to timing a parry so right that V1 essentially makes the bullets come out harder. The one issue is that it's a real pain to pull off at first. You gotta time it perfectly and the timing is just a little off from what you'd expect. It's not punch and shoot at the same time, it's shoot and then like one microsecond later punch. The footage you're about to see shows how hard it is as I consistently miss it, but rest assured that the game knows how hard it is and helps you out with it. At any time, you can leave the game to go to a mode called the Sandbox. I think my dad used to take me here when I was younger. It was a lot higher fidelity back then. Here you can set up any sort of scenario with enemies, weapons, all for the sole purpose of getting you better at the game. I spent a good while here perfecting the timing on the art of projectile acceleration, and when I learned it, it was so much fun! It's not always going to work, it's gonna take a while to get the muscle memory down, and even then, it's not always going to be the best idea to do it in the first place, but god, I can't help myself! The next few rooms are getting skimmed over, not for lack of interesting detail, more so because the gaming quality on display makes it look like I hold my controller the same way they do in ads and movies. I just wanted to do some cool shotgun tricks, don't blame me! After a quick climb up some stairs, Swords Machine comes back to avenge the gun we took. Their moveset is massively pared back thanks to the whole one arm thing, but sadly we didn't take the arm where all the attacks are coming from. They're still super deadly with just the sword, but with parrying we can scrape out a win. Next level, and if you look here sports fans, it's painfully obvious he wants to go for the shotgun parry, but he's so bad at games he can't manage it. After that is another standard room, but the real prize is off to the side. There's an overheal orb in there that can get us to 200 health, but in front of us is two malicious face. These two friendly faces herald how malicious face is now a common enemy you're just gonna have to put up with from now on. It's a major test to see how you fare against two bad dudes at once, but also emphasizes how movement is vital to stay alive. The last level of this stage has us taking a break from murder and instead indulging in our base Mario instincts. You could take a little obstacle course off to the side to clear the gap, or be cool like Sonic! After that is a room with a locked door. Well, it looks like I just gotta wait for someone to come and open it. Cerberus is the first proper boss of the game and he's exactly what you'd expect him to be, a limited moveset that hits like a pillowcase full of doorknobs. He can charge, stomp, and toss his orb at you. You can dash away from his charge, hop over his stomp, and pray that the orb doesn't shatter your skull like so many birds against so many baseballs. It's a thrilling fight that leaves you in a sweat trying to figure out how to get around it when all of a sudden... Is this just how it's gonna be from now on? Cerberus doubles up and now you have to take on the boss you are already struggling to beat and do it twice. And killing one Cerberus enrages the other and makes it even tougher. It's a tough as nails fight and seeing the other one rise up is a cold splash of water to the system. It also makes this fight amazing. You are like a gnat with a gat, just picking away at these guys who deal 25% of your health with every hit. When you do finally manage to topple these guys, it's all over. The tutorial is all over. Yep, that's right, the real game is waiting just down this hole. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, woo! On to the next world! Psych, we're actually going back to level two! See, when I said secret area, I wasn't talking about the early fight you can have with Swords Machine. If you manage to find the hidden blue skull, you can access the hidden level. Every stage has a hidden level that switches up the normal gameplay to something new. For the first level, it's something wicked. Here we have a skull, and it needs to get onto a pedestal. Sounds easy enough, but... <laughs> My entire body aches after this section. If there's one thing I'm worse at than shooters, it's horror games, and that's exactly what this is. Something Wicked turns Ultra Kill into a Screamer Slender clone. You have to navigate to the pedestal as fast as possible while avoiding the monster who is, of course, named as Something Wicked. Now, I've gone a whole three days without my nightlight on, so I'm clearly a brave boy, uh, but Screamer Horror is a real tough one for me. You can sort of fight back against Something Wicked, shooting it sends it running, but still, balancing that while trying to navigate an ever-increasingly dark maze is torture. And you want to know what happens when you finally do put the skull down? 
I don't want to play video games anymore. This is a cooking channel again. Uh, the recipe calls for a cup of milk, but all I have is this Ganondorf amiibo. That should work. So now you have to run all the way back through the maze to find the real pedestal and get out. The cruelest part of all? When you finally figure out what to do, the section takes less than a minute to accomplish. Just dash to the first one, a quick left, slide like you've never slid before, and you're done. Your reward for doing this is, a. Uh... <laughs> Well, honestly, if I created the species that made Donkey Kong, I'd say the same thing. Oh, by the way, you want to know what the best part is? The better part than the last best part I said. The monster chasing you? It's this. It's just a pissed off stick. On to the next stage, Limbo, and this game thinks it's one step ahead of me while I'm about to do a two-step all over this stupid level. Guns blazing, let's go! Malicious face is all tuckered out. So this level may look calm and serene, which given what we just went through is weird, but it's immediately unsettling. First off, all the natural sounds are coming out of hidden speakers, and we're not nearly as free as we once thought we were. Here we get introduced to the skulls that act as room keys, which we were supposed to learn about here, but I did the secret mission instead like a naughty boy. Don't tell anybody or I'll get in trouble. It's only after putting the skull on the pedestal that the stage shows its true colors by sending these pesky drones after you. Imagine if you gave a fly a gun, and that's what we're dealing with here. These guys are fast, dash out of gunfire, and explode when killed, making them seem annoying at first until you realize that you can make the explosion blow up enemies too. Oh, oh crap. One second, guys. I got a text. I just need to answer that right now. I'll uh, be right back. And there. What the f*** happened? The nail gun is our newest weapon and it's got some funny things about it. First off is the fact that it's the only item in the game with an ammo count. Shotgun and pistol are presumably fueled by anger and don't need bullets, but the nail gun is a special little sausage and needs to recharge its ammo over the course of a few seconds. This kind of takes the gun down a few pegs as the other two can be whipped out whenever you need them to do damage and are super reliable. If you're in the middle of slaughtering demons, you need something that you can depend on and an ammo system makes it undependable. But what's the upside? Death. The nail gun is amazing at reducing enemies down to atoms and turns Malicious Face, a boss, into a complete joke. Its ult fire is this weird nail that will cause the other nails to hone in on a target like a swarm of bees and deal damage, but it's only useful in big encounters where you don't have as much breathing room to worry about how fresh your kicks are while doing it. I will say that this weapon is all but a cheat code for style rankings in this game since this hallway just gives you the ultra kill rank for basically free. I should feel unfulfilled since this was basically handed to me, but um, uh, uh f you, I did it? In the final room, there's a glass ceiling that when broken lets us hop up to find a little tablet with an eye on it and pressing it says that something big has been set in motion for later. Eh, it's probably just for a hat or something, let's keep going. Limbo level two starts off with another battle arena that's way more vertical than before. You're gonna wanna get real good with slam jumps to get anywhere, especially when enemies start spawning above you. With the next couple of rooms being pretty standard stuff, I want to take a moment to mention how- Okay, look- Oh, so that's what this level is called. Street Sweepers are a new enemy with flat-out unparryable attacks. V1 is a tough boy, but I don't think they can quite punch away fire yet. They're super fast, run at you like the standard mooks, but Keely have firepower to back it up. Also, they're not demons like the rest of the enemies. These are also robots. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Play the game to find out for yourselves. It's a really interesting idea to take Limbo, which starts out as a shock to the system by being serene and downright placid, and then immediately in the next level, burning it to the ground. On to the next room, and sadly, we don't get to stick around in the burning limbo for much longer as we're back to the pals-like rooms of the last level. I even found a cheeky secret to overheal to 200 health, and I'm feeling pretty good. So not only is Malicious shown up as a regular enemy, now Cerberus is too. I'm not sure if boss Cerberus and enemy Cerberus have the same health pool or not, but if they do, it's amazing how enemies in Ultra Kill never tend to get you the same way twice. Cerberus is the first real roadblock of the game for new players, and if you beat him there, you won't have any trouble here, especially since the room is conducive to trapping him to stop the shoulder barge. Once you kill him, you can go into this room to get a collectible, or destroy some false walls for a secret. We get locked in a dungeon with a horrifying green light. <laughs> Neat. So back in the level, what you play? Stop! So 
for the uninitiated, this is a reference to the YouTuber Civi11. I know there are other YouTubers besides me, but they exist. He's a creator most known for his shooter reviews, and he's incredibly good at them. After picking up Ultra Kill early on, which is exactly how I first learned about it, Hakida, the developer of the game, put this in as a send-up to him since he's one of those channels with lore. Cancerous Rodent is obviously a joke and a very funny one, but a very Cancerous Rodent is anything but. He's got projectiles that only he can fire and are basically just recolors of the regular parryable projectiles, but they're all his, so he's got that going for him. It's a really sweet tribute to take the time to program something like this and include it for an early adopter of the game who got a lot of eyes on it. This leads us to the second tablet, and after that we can get back to the level. The last arena does a good job of setting the street sweepers apart from the rest of the enemy roster, since they're the only ones in the room that only spawn on the floor. They're essentially a trap for falling off the platforms while dealing with the other threats. After you take them down, though, you're on to the third stage. This is the stage that took the most time, not because it's hard to get to the objective, but because of bullheaded stubbornness. It's super simple, go either through the red door or the blue door and grab the skull to open the door. There are two pedestals, but you only need one. I decide to go to the blue one since it's not the color of apples. Not really hard in any way, every room is a simple affair of getting to the end until we square off with a Cerberus. It's here that I put another shotgun technique to good use. See, by quickly swapping between shotgun mods, grenade, and overpump, the animation of swapping not only cancels out, but is faster than the shotgun's regular reload. So by swapping back and forth, I never reload, therefore deal extra damage. It's not as hard as explosive shots, but doing it while moving can be tough. So I put the skull down and now have access to the boss. But for the sake of argument, say I had two skulls. There's a brain in every skull, and the more skulls you have, the more brains you have, right? So that means that the more brains I have, the more- I went down the red path next, and the warning at the beginning to stay indoors was pretty spot on, since this is a lot harder than the other path. Way more platforming in the arenas, larger enemy waves with more variety and less drones for quick and dirty kills, and multiple boss level enemies in a row. At the same time, it does an even better job of making you feel alive when you ride away on your own explosive from malicious faces, so you can circle back around and finish them off. The last room is a real butt breaker, but if you're smart enough, you can find a secret to go through the much shorter blue route while having the red skull. Of course, I wasn't smart and have never been smart and didn't grab the skull, meaning I had to drag my sorry keister all the way back. Except when I got to the door, it was locked because there were enemies on the other side, so I just had to go to the last checkpoint. Eventually, I do take down the last of the demons and got two skulls! With both, a hidden passage opens, leading us to these two. Alright kids, let's sit down in our thinking chair. What could Hakata like with a style meter, red and blue sword bosses, and a website called Devil May Quake? Maybe he's a big fan of, uh... Oh, Sonic Unleashed, Rock'em Sock'em Robots, and the Internet! Oh. Wait a minute. Do you think he's a fan of Devil May Cry? Tundra and Agony are based on DMC3 bosses, okay? I had to do a lot of work on that segment. If you could watch it over a few times, that'd be great. You may have noticed that I'm just fighting two swords machines, one of whom is always enraged, regardless of if you parry him, and the other one has access to all swords machines' phase two attacks, on top of them both still having the shotgun. You may also remember grisly deaths at the no hands of swords machines last time, but while it's no walk in the park this time, I managed to kill them both first try. When you kill Agony or Tundra, their partner will revive them to half health, and it becomes even more not about just dealing damage, but keeping one away from the other if you already dealt with them. It's super tough, but I can't describe what a power trip it is to take on a boss from a few stages ago, fight two at once, and win. This is a great measuring stick to show how in just a little time you're already way ahead of where you were before. This gives us the third tablet, and we move on to the level's boss. Hideous Mass is a heck of a bullet sponge. He can take a massive amount of damage and pair that with a lot of his body being armored, and the main challenge comes from just making sure you can focus on his attacks and not just hurting him. His attacks are fairly slow, but hit hard, along with the tether that holds you in place. My recommendation is to go for the overheat add-on to your nail gun, which turns enemies into protons. Use the original nail gun's alt fire to make sure your shots always hit, and then wail on him. Also, his tail is a secret weak spot, so don't be afraid to aim for that when he's huddled up. Or if you really want to show this damage sponge, just pair it up with some soap. He reacts like a Yu-Gi-Oh player to the concept of washing. <laughs> After he's dead and buried, you move on to the final showdown of Limbo. Like before, the boss stage doesn't have any enemies and, in fact, is oddly calm. The stage's name comes from the piano piece that plays in it, and while it's all calm, I think I should mention that music. Ultra Kill's music is something else. It's like if every musical genre played at once, and it's a constant jolt to the system. It's intense enough to keep you in the action, but memorable enough to not just fall into the background. You remember every track in this game. My personal favorites are the first Limbo song, mixing in a distorted version of the the calm music, uh, the last level we were just in's Castlevanians, 
Inspired music and this level's calming piano track. It sets the scene for this level's eerie feel. This whole place is themed after a church, and there are skeletons and diary entries showing that people once called this place home, but not anymore. Down to this guy named Gabriel. Off to the side is the fruit of our labors for all our secret hunting. Pressing the fourth tablet unlocks a new variant of the revolver. It can't shoot as fast, but does a lot more damage. You can swap between them, and they even have different properties, like the coin shot on the alternate revolver piercing instead of headshotting, a feature you can bet I used frequently. Both guns have their upsides and their downsides, and it ultimately comes down to what you value in a pistol. Personally, the lower shot rate but higher damage gels just right with what I'm going for, so I'm going to be using that from now on. After getting the new gun, I go forward to find I need three skulls to unlock the boss's door. Good joke, dude. So going forward, we- Oh no, he's me, but cooler. I cannot get over how instantly hateable this guy is, despite just being me, but red. They built smugness into this robot. Did he learn that, or were the people who just built him scum lords? V1's rival, V2, is what I described him as. You, but better. He has less weapons, just the standard pistol and shotgun without mods, but the problem is that he's playing on a higher difficulty and is therefore better than me. He moves faster, hits more shots than you. I hate him so much, and that makes makes me love him. His fight is a lot of fun, uh, but there are a lot of times where I just straight up lose track of B2 and just uh, hope for the best. If you punch the coin into him over and over again when he's posturing like a dickhead, you can actually kill him before the fight starts, which is just, just wonderful. I won't lie though, if you're playing this fight for the first time, it can be extremely frustrating. Since he moves so fast, it's hard to keep a real track on him. The only real hint you get as to how to handle him is his wing colors. They'll change depending on what mode he's in, and those change what attacks you have to go up against. However, I doubt that while you're being shot repeatedly by better you, you're gonna be in the mood to take notes on what he's doing. How you're supposed to learn what he does without having the wiki open is kind of ridiculous. It's a great fight against a rival character, just makes me really, really glad that multiplayer is all but completely off the table for this game. Imagine fighting seven of these! Please don't get any ideas. Once you finish him off, he's sent running and we get a little piece to remember him by as we take his left arm. This is the Knuckle Buster. It's slower on the uptick than the other arm, but can send out a shockwave that launches enemies into each other. But Jack, you can parry shotgun wests with it, and that's the only thing you were good at. Bye bye. Before moving on, we gotta talk about the secret level, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. I wanna try it, but... <sighs> Looks like that's just not happening. I wish I could find the hidden level. So this one changes things up by turning the ultra-violent ultra-kill into a puzzle game. If there's one thing I'm worse at than shooters, it's puzzle games. I'm not even kidding when I say that this is literally just The Witness, except with V1 instead, which makes it better. It just connect the dots in increasingly complex ways, and eventually God will have mercy on your poor, stupid soul. I can barely do monkey brain things like shooting a coin in midair. What hope do I have of matching one color to another? I would be embarrassed to admit how long I spent on this totally optional bonus level, uh, so I won't. After I finish, it reads me my diary entry from whenever I used to upload tester videos. Uh, kind of rude, but warranted. These secret levels aren't keeping any collectibles hidden, but honestly, the change of pace is fun enough to seek them out. Plus, come on, you get into this one by flicking a coin into a fountain. That's genius. Down on to the next level, and it's Lust. I look forward to the big booby anime girls with the hubba hubba jubla- This is Chicago. They put Chicago in Ultra Kill. This level's the intro to the sort of theme of lust. Instead of going for the sex type of lust, this level goes for the more literal interpretation of Dante's Inferno. Lust punished its sinners with high winds, and that was the inspiration for setting this level in a big high rise. It's a fun change of pace to put so much more emphasis on staying on the platform as opposed to fighting. And more enemies are probably gonna fall to their deaths than are killed by you. You'd think with so much verticality, you'd be in a lot more danger of falling to your death, but honestly, there are enough bounce pads to make sure that that never happens. If anything, all those bounce pads just make the level more fun to traverse around. This is definitely one that when I'm replaying individual stages I come back to first. It's so much fun to just jump around. The second stage of Lust is a real interesting one, as it's for the first time that we're not just jumping around vaguely gray things and are actually hopping around a dilapidated city. There are boss enemies like Cerberus, Street Sweepers, and the brand new half-robot, half-demon enemies who make this noise when falling. Well, I gotta get in on that. Now ah, you son of a bitch! You can even find your way into a few different buildings and find the corpses of the previous inhabitants of the town. 
For those of you who are in it for the lore, this is the level for you. You hear tell of a great king named Minos who was struck down by the previously mentioned Gabriel. Everything we've heard about this Gabriel figure paints him as pretty heavenly, what with the stained glass windows in the church level. On the other hand, King Minos is shown as a pretty cool dude, so why did Gabriel have to kill him? These are all questions for later, as deeper down in the level you can climb up this staircase before coming to a room with your new best friend, the Rail Cannon. It's the funny gun. It recharges over a course of 17 seconds when fired, but in exchange you get a shot that one hit kills almost everything in the game. It doesn't have an alt fire to start out with, but you really don't need one when it does this sort of damage. This stage ends out with the challenge that this whole game has been leading up to, fighting two different bosses at once. You have to tangle with Cerberus and Malicious Face both at once, and prove why, yeah, I think I'll keep the Rail Cannon. Level 3 is a strange one, since it's really open-ended like the two-skull door from the previous chapter, except now you have to keep circling back to the center room from other routes. On top of that, you're going to be going through a lot of water, which doesn't really change your controls, but does act as a very brief change of pace. No, no, the water may be part of the level's challenge, but the real big claim to fame is introducing the Mind Flayer. She's super fast, super strong, and her worst aspect has so much health! Fully charged pistol shots, nail guns, super shotgun hits, even the rail cannon doesn't take it down easily. It takes so much punishment and deals it back in kind with big sweeping lasers and homing energy shots. You fight too, and it's probably the toughest basic enemy in the whole game, so far. And fighting it is almost a challenge I don't look forward to, except when I win. The next level may just have the best name in the game with Court of the Corpse King, which... God, that's cool! Keeping up the Chicago theme, we're stuck in the subway and need to collect skulls to get further. This place being so barren and filled with horrible ambiance really puts you on edge. Ultra Kill does a fantastic job building up its bosses. Uh, like the previous level, I didn't show it because I actually skipped it, but if you go back after putting down a skull on a pedestal, you can see V2 sliding in front of you, showing off he's just a cocky little dickhead. Believe it or not, we've actually encountered the stage boss in almost every stage previously, but unlike Swords Machine, you may not have noticed. Once we get to the end of the track, the subway man pops his hand out to collect the fair. Mr. Hands is pretty tricky and where its movements are just unpredictable enough to where you still get hit and telegraphed enough to make you feel bad for getting hit anyway. Like, he only has three attacks and I still didn't see it coming. Sent him packing and we get back on the track. Later on, we have to go and grab another skull and place it on another pedestal. All right, I'm sick of waiting. Where's the dang boss? Hey, wait a minute, I recognize you. You may have seen this big Hulkin feller in the background of some of the stages, and this is King Minos! Or rather, King Minos after getting on the wrong side of this Gabriel fellow we've been hearing so much about. King Minos' corpse is an absolute sight to behold in terms of bosses. His scope is insane, and while his moveset seems pretty limited at first, getting him to half health reveals that he's just a flesh Gundam piloted by some yucky worms. His hits come fast, and the attack of the worms can be pretty difficult to dodge, but luckily I am smarter and faster than a corpse and can handle him. What helps me handle him is... Hi. What I'm about to say is my final pitch to get you into Ultra Kill. If you're still watching and aren't convinced by this, I have failed in my sales pitch. You can parry the punch. No, 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 you, you don't understand. You can parry the punch. I love this game. You see a giant fist flying at you and your immediate response is okay, but counter-argument... <laughs> This is the best thing ever, and I love this boss fight because of it. Throughout this whole game, V1 has been nothing but an absolute murder boss, and why should that stop at a boss who just happens to be 20 stories taller than me? Ultra Kill takes what should be really cool cutscenes in a worse game and lets you play them out yourselves. It's such a power fantasy, and it works so well. It sounds like the description of a video game in a movie or TV show that doesn't exist but sounds really cool. You get to punch back the fist of the corpse king in hell? That doesn't sound like it should be a thing that happens in a game, but it does! Of course, the only way to end the fight properly is with a fist parry! Or just shoot the hand, that's fine too. Once the corpse gets killed again, we jump into the old man's mouth. You know, out of victory, and it's on to the final level of Act 1. Or it would be if we didn't have those secret levels to tango with. So back in the place where Mind Flayer lives, there are three secret power boxes that when shot, remove all the water from the stage. Not only does that make the challenge a lot easier, it also reveals a room hidden behind a waterfall. And from there, a log of what sounds like a surviving human plays out in eerie silence. Until eventually... If there's one thing I'm worse at than shooters, it's talking to women. So, unlike the previous secret levels, which were at least still in the first-person style of the main game, All Imperfect Love Song is a visual novel. 
Now, obviously, seeing the prettiest girl in town is just V1 in a dress makes this the best one of the three, but visual novel jokes are a little played out in all honesty. I know it's a big problem in the visual novel community that visual novels have to be the butt of the joke a lot of the time, and I was worried that it was going down a similar route in this one, especially when it starts out with the classic wacky anime misunderstanding going into a deep, long diatribe about the futility of living and how nihilism is the only way to go. Mirage, you know, the prettiest girl in school, slowly goes down this long diatribe about how nothing matters and we're all gonna die some day, but it wouldn't be Ultra Kill if it didn't take the smartest route out of this possible. But it's important to remember one thing. You're wrong. Here's why. What starts out as a section all about hopelessness quickly turns into a refutation of nihilism as a whole, taking the mantra of nothing matters and flipping it into nothing matters. As someone who struggled with existential dread and dread in basically every form pretty often and is very tired of seeing pure nihilistic outlooks on life, this section was a very welcomed and important breath of fresh air. Sure, Ultra Kill is far from an emotional game except for the emotion of I am a god, but that doesn't immediately disqualify Ultra Kill from having a conversation like this. Plus the level is hidden away, something you have to go and get for yourself, which makes it fine in my book. Hearing that this section was actually based on the developer Hakuda's own battle with existential dread makes it feel even more like something that should have absolutely been included. That's all while discounting the quality of writing in the sections not about nihilism and the comedy factor of your choices being a choice and it being so stupidly long. So we head off with Mirage to go get something to eat and end the best secret level so far. Two things to note, one, it's been confirmed that Mirage is just that, a Mirage, which if that shocks you, do I have some killer news about my friend to murder? And then there's two, I want to talk about body pillows. I want to talk about body pillows. New Blood, the publishers of Ultra Kill, have on their site a reversible body pillow of V1 and Mirage that you can buy. Listen, if you don't want to buy the game, you can always support the devs in other ways. There's also a shh, secret spoiler body pillow. But to talk about that, we gotta go on to our final layer, gluttony. Important to note that this stage, while entered through lodging ourselves into King Minos' throat, does not necessarily happen inside of him. I hope. Gluttony doesn't play around. First room is a super narrow fight against a malicious face before an absolutely hellish battle arena against almost every enemy so far. There's a Mind Flayer here so you can imagine how easy it was. Cerberus, Street Sweeper, and of course the Mind Flayer set the tempo for this level, which is you made it this far and now prove you deserve it. With rooms like a fight against three Cerberus in a row, a large staircase of various enemy waves one after another with little room for error, fighting three malicious face at once and taking on another Mind Flayer in a room surrounded by acid. The level's challenge is to drown a Mind Flayer in acid. No, that's okay, I don't need that in my life. Once you clear that level, all that's left is the climax of Act 1. Gluttony is a short level, but it's the end, so whatever. As we advance through the layer for the first time in the game, we have dialogue. Someone is warning V1 not to come any further. Machine, turn back now. The layers of this palace are not for your kind. Turn back or you will be crossing the will of God. Your choice is made. As the righteous hand of the Father, I shall rend you apart, and you will become inanimate once more. If you recognize his cadence or his voice, you might know him as Gianni Matragano. He's a pretty big voice actor online who you may know best for- Put me down! I'm a law in this town, you hear me, Oh, hey, babe. <laughs> Gabriel is a little different. This is the first time in the game that you feel genuinely helpless. For every other boss in the game, like Malicious Face, Cerberus, even V2, there was always a chance you were going to beat them. It wouldn't take more than uh, one or two tries. They were meant to show you how there were people just as good as you. Gabriel is to show you that there are people better than you. I made jokes earlier about Hakata's totally healthy obsession with Devil May Cry, but then Gabriel started spamming Helm Splitters like it was DMC3. V2 may have been fast, but he couldn't literally teleport. He's super fast, shreds your health like cheese, and has a second enraged form that doubles all of those problems. That being said, I love this fight. In a game all about being this walking definition of power fantasy, Gabriel is a genuine roadblock and is the best thing he could be. 
He stops you dead in your tracks and makes you learn all of his patterns, dodging his helm splitters, keeping away from his ring of swords, and when you finally get it, you get to dance around all of his offense. And what better way to finally put him down than with a perfect shotgun shot? Whoa! Didn't even whiff it this time! What? How can this be? Bested by this... this thing? You insignificant fuck! This is not over! May your woes be many and your days few. <laughs> Ass. <laughs> After failing to beat V1, Gabriel is dragged in from some sort of heavenly council and scolded, saying that he's lost the right to the Father's light until he kills us, and he only has 24 hours to do it. Wait, have I gone through three layers of hell in only 24 hours? If he fails, he gets trapped in the body pillow. M machine may your woes be many, and your days mew. With that, Act 1 of Ultra Kill is over. Or is it? See, there's a secret level for gluttony, but uh, it's a little different. See this door covered in P? The P stands for perfect. If you want to get into this door and fight the secret boss, you have to get a perfect rank on every level in the game. Remember how bad I am at shooters? I managed to get two perfects on some of the bosses, but other than that, yeah, that just isn't happening this time around. But I want to try, I just don't have the time to do it right now. But hey, if curiosity gets the better of you and you're eager to see what the boss is before I show you, please be my guest and go find him yourself. You won't regret it. Or maybe you will, it's really hard. As for the next layer, well, it is out right now and has a ton of new goodies and even a rematch, but to review it without the other two layers of the act seems kinda stinky. Uh, besides, the more videos I get to make on Ultra Kill, the better. I hope that me rambling on for however long it ends up being at time of editing has shown you that I don't just think Ultra Kill is a great game, I think it's a really special game with a lot to give and a lot to experience. Uh, the level design, combat, learning curve, and secrets are all worth the journey to experience. I want so badly to see Ultra Kill flourish and become the game it deserves to be. It's still only an early access! I fell in love with it instantly, and I know you will too.